So in this lecture, we are going to look at another proper pro pro popular protocol that is used to enable wide area network and it is called Sigfox. So Sigfox is a protocol that is proprietary and it supports very low data rate of few hundred bits per second. But most importantly, Sigfox as a protocol supports very long transmission range of over 10 kilometers. So how is a Sigfox uh, network organized? It is organized in the form of a star topology. And at the center of the topology is an always on listening uh, gateway device. And a large number of IoT or end devices could be communicating directly to this gateway device. Now, as most of the applications that Sigfox targets are where there is a transmission from the IoT device uh, to the gateway, this protocol is highly uplink focused. So how does the physical layer of Sigfox look like? Let's look at it step by step. So this protocol operates in the unlicensed frequency band in the sub gigahertz frequency. And let's recall that the operation on sub gigahertz frequency band enables long range because of the better propagation characteristics of the radio waves at lower frequencies. And the precise frequency can vary from one region to another. So to achieve very high range, Sigfox also generates very narrow band uh, signals of only few hundred hertz uh, bandwidth. So this has an impact that it allows the receiver to, uh, to be able to receive these transmissions at very high sensitivity. And this helps us significantly improve the signal to noise ratio. And it also makes Sigfox transmissions to be highly resilient to the interference. So one of the peculiarities of the Sigfox protocol is its unbalanced uplink and downlink. And it differs in bandwidth, data rate, and the modulation scheme. And this is because this protocol is highly uplink focused because of the kind of applications uh, that they target. There are also different duty cycle and transmit power between uplink and downlink. And in fact, the power also differs from region to region. So typically, for example, in United States, the Sigfox protocol transmits at much higher uh, power transmit power compared to at other parts, let's say like in Europe. So what are the typical link budget for Sigfox that we talk about? First, uh, while transmitting at low data rate and bandwidth allows us to significantly improve the link budget. And we are, we are typically talking about 150 to 160 dB uh, of uh, link budget for a transmit power of about 20 dBm at the Sigfox transmitter. And this corresponds to a receive sensitivity for a Sigfox receiver to be about one minus 130 dBm. And all of this translates to a real world range of 10 to 15 kilometers in urban environments, which is very significant. So how does the medium access control mechanism for Sigfox look like? It has an Aloha style medium access control mechanism, which if we recall, means that the nodes can transmit whenever they want and there is no acknowledgement that is received. In particular, the Sigfox protocol send, sends the same message three times to increase the reliability. And after sending a transmission, Sigfox listens for downlink messages for a predefined period of time at a known frequency. So how does the uplink packet look like? Typically we have about 29 bytes with about 12 bytes allocated for the payload. So it's we are looking at sending very small amounts of information. And that also uh, is because the data rate that it supports is just few hundred bits per second. And then the packet has the usual fields that you can find in the packet structure like preamble, CRC, authentication, etc. So how does the downlink packet look like? It has a very similar structure, but it has even smaller payload. Again, it goes back to the protocol being much more uplink focus. And we should also recall that it, ha it has somewhat larger preamble and other fields uh, uh, are, some, uh, are similar to the uh, uplink packet. So the uh, the as we are, if we recall the Sigfox is a proprietary protocol and it is deployed by the Sigfox company and and its uh, its networks are also managed by the company uh, and you need to take the subscription from this particular company to start using uh, Sigfox in your IoT devices so they take care of maintaining the deployment of gateways and you buy subscription and then you can start to sort of like uh, transmit and sort of like receive the information over a cloud. Uh, for the packets that have been transmitted from your IoT device. 
So finally, SIGFA protocol has also very wide coverage. So this is, shows basically the coverage in the United States, but it also is present in other parts and in particular in Europe. So that that was uh, the SIGFOX protocol. So in the now in the final part of the lecture, we are going to talk about TV white spaces. So we still have terrestrial TV broadcasts in major parts of the world. And this occurs in typically sub gigahertz frequency band. And if we recall, the sub gigahertz frequency band are great for propagation and it sort of like allows you to communicate at long distances for the same transmit power. So many of the bands that are allocated in the spectrum for the television transmissions are often left unused and it can vary from region to region within the same country, but also with that, uh, uh, from time to time. As an example, for example, the television broadcast could be turned off in the evening and then those frequency bands are unoccupied. So the question is that can we actually use these TV white space uh, bands for communication? And what are the policies that actually dictate if we can use these TV white space frequency bands? So what, what, what is the case is that in some parts of the world, you are actually allowed to use these frequency bands with the catch that you don't interfere with the primary usage of the spectrum, which is to uh, transmit television signals. So as long as you don't uh, disturb the transmissions that are already existing and don't cause interference to, let's say, television receptions, you are allowed to use the TV white space band in some parts of the world. So who controls it? It's, uh, it, it is controlled by an authority that looks at the spectrum allocation, which can be, for example, FCC in the case of United States. But do note that it can vary from country to country, and some countries might not allow you to actually use these empty TV white spaces for communication for your IoT device. So how do we find the precise uh, channel or the precise space in the TV white space to use for wireless communication? The frequency can vary spatially. As an example, different regions in the country may have different allocation of TV frequency. And we have also talked about that it can vary from time. For example, a particular TV station could turn off in the evening. So how do we find these frequencies? We can take the approach of sort of like dynamically uh, identifying the frequency by scanning for the free uh, spot in the frequency allocation. For example, you could have your receiver sort of like scan for uh, transmissions from a uh, uh, a starting to ending frequency and then figure out okay where they, it doesn't see transmissions for a period of time and then it can start to sort of like communicate at those frequency bands. Another approach could be that someone could sort of like do this scanning for you and create a database and you could consult this database to figure out what are the free spots and what period of time that you can use for your own communication. So with this we come to an end of this uh, uh, lecture. <laughs>